Several people close to then-candidate Trump's campaign have denied having ties to Russia. And now one Russian oligarch is trying to distance himself from the president. According to flight records, Dmitry Rybolovlev's jet shared a tarmac with Trump's plane in North Carolina back in the month of November. Now, he allegedly was in Las Vegas in late October when Trump was there, too. And just last week, the Russian billionaire's yacht was spotted in the Caribbean near top Trump financier Robert Mercer's own luxury liner. What does all this mean? Well, journalist Ryan Chilcote has been covering Russia for the better part of two decades, and he joins me now from London. Ryan, good to speak with you. Who is Dmitry Rybolovlev? Am I saying it right? Yeah, Rybolovlev. It's a very difficult last name to say. Uh, he's a very interesting character. So he was effectively Russia's fertilizer king in the late 90s and the first half of uh, the uh, from 2000 to 2005, he was the main owner of a company called Ural Kali, which produces something called uh, p potash, which is an essential ingredient in fertilizer. And at the time, really had you know a, a huge amount of uh, of the world's market share, so it could kind of dictate prices. So it was a good asset to own. But uh, he effectively got pushed out of Ural Kali. Many people think by the Kremlin, and so he moved uh, to Europe. Um, and really started to, you know, kind of live a lavish lifestyle. He bought a football team. Uh, he bought, uh, most uh, famously, of course, uh, Donald Trump's home uh, that he had bought to flip in uh, Palm Beach for $95 million. He spent tens of millions of dollars on an apartment in New York. Um, and uh, he spent a couple billion dollars on art as well. Uh, but, you know, back in Russia, he's really uh, sort of not you know, talked about in business circles very much anymore because he's kind of been outside of Russian business for a good decade now. So outside of Russian business, is he in any way involved in Russian politics? No, he isn't. And I think that's what makes this story so interesting. Um, you know, if you were to ask me of, say, you know, the 100 billionaires or so that Russia has, you know, where he would rank in terms of his closeness to the Kremlin, you know, I'd put him in the, the, the sort of bottom 50. I, I wouldn't put him in the top 50. Uh, I certainly wouldn't put him in the top dozen. You know, you normally think about sort of, uh, when you think about billionaires in Russia, you think about Putin's billionaires, you know, the sort of maybe dozen or so Russian billionaires that many people say, uh, you know, sort of own their or owe their wealth of Vladimir Putin's rise. Mm -hmm. Well, he's not part of that. And uh, he's, he's nowhere close because effectively, you know, ever since he left Russia, he's pretty much stayed out of the picture and tried to, to steer clear of politics. Yeah, I mean, on Wall Street, there's all this talk about uh, Donald Trump when he was just a businessman having difficulty uh, getting financing for some of his projects. There's been speculation that perhaps he turned to uh, outside lenders outside the U.S. Is there any financial connection uh, giving any of the banking ties uh, of this billionaire? Well, there's a possible connection, and that possible connection is the Bank of Cyprus. So, Dmitry Rybavlovlev was a depositor in the Bank of Cyprus, like many other Russians, and not only Russians, but in particular Russians, when uh, the Bank of Cyprus effectively went bust. And as a result, he lost his deposits in the bank. This was uh, in the early days of the sort of financial crisis in Europe. Uh, he ended up with shares. So, at one point, he was the biggest shareholder in the Bank of Cyprus with about 10, a 10 percent stake. Now, uh, it, subsequently, he exited uh, the, the Bank of Cyprus, and Wilbur Ross, our now uh, commerce, uh, uh, Secretary of Commerce, uh, uh, led a team of investors uh, in buying uh, up uh, shares in, in Bank of Cyprus and became the vice chairman. Uh, so there is a little bit of a connection there. People have asked, including U.S. senators, have asked, uh, you know, during the confirmation process, uh, the Secretary of Commerce, uh, when he was going through that, whether Donald Trump borrowed any money from the Bank of Cyprus. Uh, and they were told, at least one senator on the record, uh, by, um, by uh, Wilbur Ross that no, uh, he was not aware of any financial connections between uh, the Bank of Cyprus and Donald Trump. Now, some people say it's odd that the uh, Trump administration has refused to actually provide Mr. Ross's written answers to the senator's questions about mm -hmm. the Bank of Cyprus. But, you know, not knowing what those answers were, it's really difficult to say what's there. The other connection is, of course, that, uh, and I, I know we're 
getting this is getting a bit complicated. But uh, mm -hmm. one of uh, President uh, Trump's big financial lenders was uh, Deutsche Bank, right. and the uh, then C the CEO, uh, the one-time CEO of Deutsche Bank, is now the CEO of the Bank of Cyprus. But again. You know, it's uh, it's interesting, but it doesn't suggest anything nefarious. Right. Tangential connections at the moment, but that's one of the things that people want to see in the sure. now president's tax returns to say where did his financing come from, where did his funds come from, um, and those answers haven't been given, so there's all this speculation. But before we let you know, I want to go, I want to quickly ask you about the latest on this Yahoo hack investigation. Uh, four Russians are now facing charges for the hack, including two Russian spies. Will we see a response from the Kremlin? Yeah, I think we probably will see a response from the Kremlin. It's uh, late at night uh, in Moscow right now, so I suspect we'll get a response tomorrow. So uh, of the four Russians, two were sort of criminal hackers. One was uh, arrested in Canada. The other is thought to be in Russia. And then there were two, uh, according to U.S. officials, two Russian FSB or intelligence officials that effectively had hired these hackers to hack into to Yahoo and other accounts. So uh, one of those two Russian intelligence officials is actually in a Russian jail as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, he was arrested about a month and a half ago by the Russians themselves on charges of treason, possibly giving the CIA information. Is this all extremely confusing? You bet it. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, I think we will hear the Russians say something. And it's probably going to be along the, the lines of, you know, we've heard this before. Uh, there's this big anti-Russian hysteria in the United States. We're always mm -hmm. blamed for everything. And it's just uh, uh, not fair and unuseful. I suspect that's what the Kremlin might say. I think it's a pretty good guess. That, that sounds like a good talking point, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ryan Chilcote in London.